Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. First of all, quick apology about the audio in the last video. I'm doing all my recordings from my truck this week as I'm on a vacation with my family this week and next week, and uh, this is my recording studio, and I was a bit far away from my mic. But let's get into the content today because it's going to really piggyback on what we discussed in Monday's update. The first map you've been looking at here shows you the latest sea surface temperature anomalies, and I've highlighted a few things I want you to really think about here. Let's start in the Atlantic. We do have actually three active areas in the Atlantic we're watching right now, although none of them are actually a threat against the United States in terms of delivering a powerful tropical cyclone. But the moisture from those is going to be important to be watching. Main story here is that we still have quite a bit of warm water across the Atlantic. And while we're a little cooler to the north where the subtropical high sits, in the main development region, the Caribbean and in the Gulf, ocean temperatures are about a degree to a degree and a half above normal. So that's going to be an energy supply for the storms later on. Secondly, if we come over to the the Pacific, let's stay along the equator. We've recently seen some stronger upwelling of some cooler water. There's not much left to upwell here, so to see this cooler water making this resurgence is really kind of a, a signal that the trade winds are still quite strong. And where I see them being the strongest is over here on this side of the Pacific. Now, just remember, anytime we see those east to west blowing trade winds stronger than normal, that's often a signal. When they stay st sustained stronger than normal, that's often a signal of La Nina. It's what spreads this cooler water in this direction and allows it to upwell. We're going to come back to that in a second. But honestly, the thing I've been most focused on is this right here. We've now seen in the last couple of weeks the warmer water that was north of Hawaii edge its way toward the west coast. Therefore, the cooler water that has been in this area has started to erode, and you can really kind of see that. We just noticed that in some of these areas here, the ocean temperature anomalies are not as strong as they were. Now, the reason why this is important is all about where it places the heat, where it's correlated historically with the heat. And what this will likely do in terms of the behavior of the pattern is flatten out the jet stream a bit over the Pacific Northwest. So instead of those deep troughs we have been seeing, the jet stream might retreat a bit farther to the north and flatten out. And that tends to take more of the ridging that had been here and just push it a bit farther to the west with making the, the ridge axis probably here along the front range of the Rockies. And we're going to see that, I think, taking shape here in the near-term forecast. But I want to just make a very important point about the strength of this La Nina. These trade winds are still cooking. I mean, go from today all the way through the 15th of July, and you see the, the blue-green shading here. That is where we have, right over this part of the Pacific, very strong trade winds. Southern Oscillation Index uh, is still down there around minus 16, minus 17. Uh, the daily contributions right now are like the minus 25 range. And, and again, the farther negative uh, you go on, or, excuse me, excuse me, positive, those are all positive numbers. The farther positive you go on those numbers, the stronger the, uh, cor uh, the correlation is with La Nina. So uh, sorry for that mistake, but th that's what we're watching, these trade winds. And another component of this is, is what that means historically. And I showed you this on Monday, but let's just come back and look at it again. What this means is if we pull out all those summers, July and August, where we had strong La Ninas, and I could make an argument that this one still has the telltale signs of a strong La Nina, we just have our greatest risk of being dry here, you know, which is in the central and western Corn Belt to the Mid-South. Wetter along the East Coast, wetter in the Southwest Monsoon, but this seems to be where the ridging is. Another part of this is that we still have very low atmospheric angular momentum. The values are way down here. And just in general, when these are lower, the pattern favors more blockiness. It favors a farther to the north jet stream. It favors a weaker jet stream. And the only place we've picked up momentum in the last week or so has been down here around Antarctica, not, not uh, in the northern hemisphere. Uh, so I look at all of these things and combine it with what's going on with the MGO right now, which makes sense. It's sweeping through phases four and five, which is what we thought. But we do anticipate this to come back around to phase six and seven and eight at some point. But this this is all very supportive of that broken up jet stream pattern that we've been kind of discussing. Now, if nothing was really changed in the background state of things, that's kind of the main point here. The only thing the only thing we discussed changing was the depth of the Hudson Low. We talked about that a lot on Monday. So if nothing else has really changed except the depth of that Hudson Low, what you're going to see here is some interesting model behavior kind of trying to pick out on where this is all going to go. So let me show you what I mean. Jet stream level winds, they're color-coded. So the brighter the color, the faster the winds. We're looking more about the shape here. 
as we play through this weekend and take you out there to the 4th of July, there's that persistent West Coast trough. Here is that Hudson Low we kept talking about. And the ridge, it's parked right over parts of the Mid-South and the Lower Mississippi River Valley, where it has been. Now, as we play it forward into the uh, that week of the 4th of July, let's take you out through Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Again, you could still follow this jet stream flow doing something like this. The ridge is sitting here. That goes around the Hudson Low, which is kind of sitting in this vicinity. Now let's keep going. This is out there Friday, July 8th. Go out there to the 9th and 10th. Where did the ridge go? Remember, it was sitting here when we started, and it moved to the west as anticipated. This flow is still there, but it's a bit. there's a bit of a split to it. The most important thing is the split is not on the west coast. It's out here in the Gulf of Alaska. So the jet stream comes in and rolls up over the top of it and then dives around the Hudson Low. Let's keep going. That's day 10, July the 10th. As we keep moving this out there, what I want you to see is that the models are keeping some sense of a trough here. The strongest winds running around the northern tier of the United States, but the ridge is backing up. So here's the story I'm going to make for you. And this is going to be a bit of a, I don't know what you want to call it. I've heard some of my colleagues call it a buyer beware type situation with the models. This is going to light up a lot of storms that are going to cascade in this direction. There's going to be a lot of southeastern storms and storms along the Atlantic. The Mid-South is going to be dry back into Texas. We're going to watch ridge runners go over the top of this, and there'll be an active Canadian storm track. That's what you get out of this pattern. So when you look at the next 15 days, this is what this afternoon's European model suggests. Now you see it. The flow comes in, dies around that trough northwest flow out of the jet stream here initiating a lot of thunderstorms i'm very concerned about this area in the coming weeks not just soon in, in the near term but in the coming weeks in terms of those damaging squall lines that like to come out in this direction that's climatologically excuse me climatologically consistent with this time of year but i'm also concerned about the drought development that'll happen here with the ring of fire around it the high sits right underneath it and we continue to stay very hot and very dry now, the buyer beware aspect of what I just shared with you is this. This is just your next 15 days. If we look out there at the new ECMWF weeklies, look at how similar they look. You see, when you initialize a forecast model, often what happens is the most dominant features that show up, even when you run it out 30 to 45 days, the most dominant features that push the anomalies in a certain direction are, are, are those that the model was initialized with. So can you see how this 30-day forecast for July looks very similar to the first 15 days? The model is losing all signal after the first 15 days. It's that low predictability time of year. And if I just slide, I'm going to do this quickly, but if I even take you all the way out here, how about, I don't know, let's go out to the 14th. So uh, the 14th of August, uh, July, excuse me, to the 14th of August. What you noticed is that from the previous run, this was all very, very dry. We had the southwest monsoon, and we were wet here. That's been consistent here and here, but this is now no longer as dry. And what I'm going to make the case of here is that the reason why the model has lost the dry signal is not because it's not there. It's lost it because in the near term, there's going to be storms that run the, the edge of that. So I don't think that the latest European weeklies have the pattern right. Now, I could be certainly proven wrong. I am almost every day. But the point here is that I think we just need to see, well, I just think we need to see more information to know if this ridge event, which is historically correlated. I mean, we showed you that a few moments ago. If you've got a La Nina like this, okay, we know that historically that is correlated with risk in this area for going dry at some point in July and August. I would not look at these new European weeklies and say that it's been busted and it's gone. Now, we also know this. Going into this time period, this is what the last 15 days of precipitation compared to normal look like. It is quite normal to be this dry in the West. But look how, look at this southwest monsoon cranking up. That's over 300% of normal precipitation in places. But then you notice from Colorado through parts of Nebraska, even Kansas in through here, but western Iowa, southern Minnesota, and this part of South Dakota, very dry. We've had some bigger storm complexes that have rolled through here, including one that went through Illinois last week. But down here, very dry in the Mid-South. And these storms that came through into Texas were followed by days with 100 degree temperatures. The spotty drought areas that you see here, I expect improvement on. But for me, close to home, this part of Indiana over to Ohio, 
Western Kentucky, Tennessee into Michigan, this is an area that I'll be watching very carefully. So here, here, and here are the three spots, that little triangle right there that I'm watching most closely. Now, when we look at the statistics, since June is almost done, this is the, uh, well, June's done today, uh, this is the precipitation ranks by climate district. Now you can see similar data, but now we put a number on it. Remember the closer out of the number 130, that'd be the driest since 1893, number one would be wet. And the maps line up quite well, even though this includes the whole month, whereas the one I just showed you was the previous month. But all of this in through here, and getting up into Illinois and Indiana, that is all now shown up on the latest drought monitor. We've seen the drought increase in this area, a lot of increase here, and it remains quite persistent from the west parts of Texas into western Texas, getting here into the Great Basin. And uh, this map is telling us about the cumulative long-term stresses. So we need to see where there's going to be near-term correction. But I want to let you know, this is an area in the Mid-South that I'm still most concerned about going forward. I want to make a case for that next. Okay, So we've now seen that longer range. What's going on today? Well, here's the latest satellite imagery from this afternoon as I was recording this. A lot of deep convection down here in the south, so big storms are popping. Drier stripe in between because the next front is still lingering way up here to the north. We are going to watch this as it comes through the UP and into Wisconsin, initiate some storms, and those storms could build on down the line. But that's what you got. These low-pressure systems going through Canada, draping weak fronts through the northern tier of the United States. From here, though, I would like to talk about the tropical systems because there's actually a low that's sitting off the coast here of Georgia and South Carolina. We'll come back to that in a second. And then we have this system here this uh, that's moved over the last three days from basically southern Louisiana to this part of Texas. And outside of the view of this satellite, we have potential tropical cyclone number two. It is expected to be named very soon, but it is going to do something we haven't seen uh, since 1996, I think it was, with Hurricane Otto, and that was cross Central America and maintain its strength over into the East Pacific. Now, what I want to watch for this time of year, and I do not think that potential tropical cyclone number two is going to do it, but sometimes tropical storms and hurricanes can make a turn inland and deliver moisture to Texas. If I controlled the weather, I would dial this up in an instant. And the reason why is because as it traverses Mexico, it loses all of the potential due to the wind damage. And what we get is the moisture plume that rises through here and delivers just absolutely perfect rain. And we need to be watching these Pacific to deliver something like that. Systems that come out of the Gulf often rapidly strengthen and they give us all the typical problems we have with tropical cyclones. But the one that's in the Gulf right now is not expected to do much. It's right here. And every single forecast that I've seen in this whole week has been disappointing me more and more on where it's going to deliver its precipitation. Because this is the latest from the WPC. You see most of the heaviest rain is now confined into east, far eastern Texas. Whereas earlier in the week, I thought this whole area was going to be getting more precipitation. So if you've been watching your forecast in this area, you've just seen every day the amount being reduced. But again, this is your next seven days. And what we need to be thinking about here is that Canadian storm track rolling up into the Hudson Low, the weaker fronts that are going to come here, meeting up with the flow riding around the ridge, initiating storms. We're going to watch out for severe storms in this area. And then we have the stronger trade winds still coming around the big subtropical high that's feeding moisture into the southeast. So a lot more storms are expected in that area. And by the way, there's a very potent low coming in just after or during the 4th of July into the Pacific Northwest that's really got my attention. We're going to talk about that in just a few seconds here. First, if I just if I had to give you two maps that I wanted you just to take in and remember about this pattern, this is the first one. This is the probability of getting one inch of rain from the European Ensemble over the next 10 days. And now you can see that corridor. You can see the wetter conditions in the southeast through the mid-Atlantic. And you can now see the storms running the periphery of the ridge sitting over Texas. It starts here and moves to Texas. So I'm going to show you the other map I want you to remember, which is this one. And if you got my morning reports today, you've already seen these. This is the new updates. What this map shows you is the probability of getting less than a half inch. So I expect rapid drought expansion in Texas and Oklahoma and parts of Arkansas and Missouri. This is the place we're going to see it continue. And in the near term, the storms are going to run the periphery of that and cascade out of the northwest. That's what we're seeing. Tonight, on Thursday night, we've got this area from the UP into Iowa, 
potential for severe storms and a lot of scattered storms as you already saw down in the south and southeast. Tomorrow, that all stays the same here. The front sags farther to the south. And we're going to keep an eye here on the tail of it, wrapping back up here into parts of Nebraska, South Dakota, and Wyoming. As we get into the day on Thursday, this or excuse me, Thursday, this would now be Saturday, the second, you're going to see that front really stretch its way into New England where we're going to watch for severe storms. But this whole area you see shaded here has the risk of seeing some pop-up storms out of this pattern. I want to show it to you by going to the high res NAM. We're going to pick this up this evening about 6 o'clock. This is the 18Z run. So you're going to see the storms lining up right here in the overnight hours. They start in the UP, northern Wisconsin, and move south. We need this rain to hold together in Michigan. See how it's breaking up there? We also need the rain that's stretched out on the front into western Iowa, Nebraska. Need all of this to hold together in the overnight hours and then move into Illinois. Do you notice as we get toward the morning hours, things break up? That's unfortunately quite typical. And at that point, our attention is going to turn down here to the south because the tropical system we were watching tomorrow morning on Friday will now be pushing along the coast into Louisiana. Earlier in the week, gosh, this thing was going to come up like that. And now you can see where the moisture is confined here. Also, more storms in the southeast. Look at Georgia and South Carolina as we go through the afternoon on Friday. What I'm concerned about is that these storms are going to kind of uh, leapfrog over big sections of Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, and southern Michigan, and then reform on Friday afternoon and evening and keep pushing through parts of the eastern Corn Belt. That now gets you to 12 a.m. on Saturday as we play through the early morning hours on Saturday getting out there toward midday on Saturday. We're going to let this finish up on Saturday night. That's where we're watching the pattern kind of take shape. A lot of scattered, isolated storms, very few widespread rainfall events in the near term. From here, though, we got to let our multi-model analysis pick back up. And by the way, both the GFS and the ECMWF have very similar skill scores right now. We've already played through the day on Thursday into Friday afternoon and evening. And now we're going to go out to Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, and evening. So this is where we're going to pick back up. There's your deeper low wrapping around the Hudson. There it is here. The front that stretched out right in through there. It's in both models. Very well resolved. You're going to see flashes of green in the southeast every single afternoon and evening. That's all fed on moisture from the trade winds, and it's just going to pop down there. Whoops. So if we keep going, this is now Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, and evening. And now we're going to get into the 4th of July. There's the morning on the 4th of July, the afternoon and evening. Now, can you see the storms cascading down this flow right there? That's northwest flow aloft. There's a weak frontal boundary. It's actually just stretched like that. And it's curling into this powerful low that's going to be coming in here into the northwest. Now, I know you don't see closed contours around it. But for this time of year to have a low like this going into the northwest, that's packing quite a punch could give you some, you know, we always joke about natural fireworks, but the southeast, the uh, southwest monsoon, and this whole corridor right in through here could see some storms on Monday night. Now let's go past Monday into Tuesday. We see that that low starts to push here by Tuesday night over the Red River Valley of the North and into southern Manitoba, but we keep seeing storm systems. You see them cascading into this area by the time I take you all the way out to next Thursday into Friday. So that's the pattern that we see becoming established right now. And what I want to do is show you where it is by the time we get to day 10. A couple of important things. There's still a trough here associated with that Hudson Low. But what we have lost is the depth of the trough here. Now, we expected that. Remember, we talked about losing that, that stronger feature in the northwest. So that pushes the ridge back to the west. And therefore, the, the heat and dryness tends to go with it. Now, this flow tends to produce right here where I'm kind of drawing these lines, northwest flow that initiates storms. And that's why the 12Z GFS has southwest monsoon, active Canadian storm track, northwest flow, and storms. See them right in through there? The dryness is south of it underneath the ridge. And for completeness, this is the European same time. See the placement of the ridge? See how the heights have gone up here? That's all due to that ocean temperature change. That's a big component of this. And the European has the same look right there. So this is the area that I'm going to keep a close eye on as we go through the beginning of July all the way to mid-month. Now, after that, this is going to fall apart. If we let history be our guide, this is going to ridge back out in the midsection of the country. And I'm going to watch out for that, and I hope that I'm wrong. 
but we need to finish our discussion today by talking about temperatures. We've played major catch up in the month of June in the midsection of the country after how cool it was in May and April. So we're getting back all those GDUs we missed out on. The Northwest has finally seen some warmer days as of late. California, no sustained long-term heat yet. We have not seen it despite some of the kind of the fragility of the reservoir situation in the West. It's good to not see, you know, 10 to 15 days of 100 degree heat in the Central Valley. And instead, we keep seeing some cooler days. Texas has been the spot that's taken all the heat and it's going to continue to do that. So that's not good for the South. And I wish I had a different story. I'm actually praying for a hurricane for you guys to come out of the Pacific. Back to the temperatures, though. Here's today's highs. We've already seen these. There's Friday getting into Saturday and Sunday. That's July the 3rd, July the 4th. Look how cool the West is going to be. The heat will be in the midsection of the country, triple digits right up the valley, right up the valley, excuse me, right up the center part uh, of the United States here. As we go into Tuesday the 5th, same deal, even out to the 6th, the heat is confined there. And the new updated maps for the five-day sliding window of temperature look like this from the European. As we go out there, from July 3rd to July 8th, coming all the way here, July 5th through the 10th, coming out here even farther, out to the day 10 through 15, you can see that that time period, July 10th through the 15th, where the ridge sits, the heat's going to stay. So again, watch for the storms to cascade over the top of this, following the Canadian storm track and weaker fronts. But underneath it, this is where I've got the greatest risk of heat and drought. And of course, that's echoed by the Climate Prediction Center. They released this today, July 8th through the 14th. They've got a huge area here in the plains and parts of the Mid-South and the Western Corn Belt that is under a moderate risk for heat and, in, uh, and a high risk for excessive heat. So multiple forecasting agencies are, are picking up on the same signals that I shared with you. Very quickly, we've got heat and dryness in other parts of the world. For example, we come over to Europe. Our heat wave is slowly progressing to the east. It's now centered between Romania, Poland, you know, Belarus, and, and, and Ukraine. And we notice that over the next 10 days, very dry conditions overall in that area with some storms farther to the south on that heat. And also just want to finish with a bit on China since we talked about it last time. Latest forecast model runs still very, very dry along the Yangtze River, but the Mayu front is advancing, and I do want you to see that the Indian monsoon is making its very quick northward advancement as well. We expect an active monsoon in India this year. But back into China, keep an eye on the uh, North China Plain and the Manchurian Plain, especially for corn and soybean farmer. I've not been able to identify any major stresses yet. They were a little wet at times, but we need to keep an eye here where there's drought being forming, uh, forming Excuse me, to the south. Hey, have a great, safe 4th of July. It is my favorite holiday. Uh, I love it because I get to spend time with my whole family during this. Hope you all have a good one and safe one as well. Take care. Thanks.